Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. As we continue to hear the important calls of racial justice across our country and our state, I speak with Mark Claxton. He's a former New York City police detective about police reforms in South Carolina. But first, I spoke with Kirk Foster. He's the Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the University of South Carolina. Here's our conversation. Kirk Foster, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Gavin. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Okay, Kirk, I just want to ask you, I asked, um, just want to get an idea, I guess, about how you feel like the social justice landscape of not only our country, but the state of South Carolina is looking right now. When you see protests, when you see uh, a lot of discord and rhetoric, how do you see things right now in the state and the country? Well, Gavin, you know, the challenge really that we have today is we've come to a point of reckoning. And the, the, the tenets of social justice are that um, we have a fair and equitable society where each individual matters. And what we see now in the streets, not only um, in South Carolina, but across the country, and we've seen most notably this week um, in Wisconsin, are individuals taking to the streets to, um, to voice their discontent with the way that um, institutions have historically treated them, that have have reinforced these ideas that their lives don't matter. And so as we think about what's happening through this lens of social justice and, um, and the Black Lives Matter movement, um, we see that folks are out there um, making a claim for how lives do matter and, and trying to move this needle forward um, in a way that creates a just and equitable society for all people. Mm -hmm. And Kirk, you are the Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at USC, so you're having these conversations, you've been having these conversations, uh, you know, with, with white people, with black people, with people of all different backgrounds and races. Tell me, um, you know, what you maybe see a lot of when you talk with people in the white community and they're saying, you know, maybe they're saying, why do we have to keep having these conversations? You know, all lives matter. Why can't people understand that? Can you maybe break it down for people who maybe don't understand why, why the exception for black lives matter or why these protests need to continue to happen for people who maybe just don't have any interaction with uh, that kind of situation? This is, the reason this matters and, and the reason, one of the reasons that we see what we do today is the result of 400 years of history in the United States where um, the lives of African Americans haven't mattered, um, where we have built institutions that have reinforced themselves um, generation after generation that um, keep certain people in positions of power and influence. And so um, certainly when, when I talk to uh, white folks who look like me, um, we have conversations about, um, you know, about protests, about demonstrations. You know, why do, why do we have to go to these extremes? Well, we, we go to these extremes. You know, people have gone to the streets. Um, folks have, have begun to protest more regularly and more visibly because they are tired of these institutions that have kept their lives mattering less, right? That have kept, um, have kept them from accessing certain, um, you know, certain resources education, um, quality health care, um, quality education. If we think about the ways in which resources are distributed in our society, um, how tax dollars are spent, um, we, we see clear lines of division among white folks and among black and brown folks. And so, um, and, and so when I talk to white folks, um, I, you know, I talk about that history. I talk about why it is um, that the burden is now ours and the burden should have all always been ours. The responsibility um, for changing these systems of oppression rests with folks who look like me. Um, African Americans in this country have, have carried that um, burden for generation after generation. And um, as we think about as we think about um, democracy and the American ideals and what it means to be an American, if we think about um, this idea of liberty and justice for all. And we have to take a step back and critically examine 
uh, American society, the institutions, and when I when I talk about institutions, I'm thinking specifically of of those rules, right, and those roles and those norms um, that are both implicit and explicit. So those that are sort of embedded in the rule of law, but but those um, that replicate themselves in very informal ways. And again, you know, these systems tend to, to repeat themselves and regenerate themselves one generation after the next. And so, so when I talk with folks who look like me, it's about critically examining our own lives and our own narratives. And it's, it's about um, understanding better how we have been complicit in creating and reinforcing these systems that have, have kept these clear lines of division um, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And we always, you know, you, you hear everyone talk about equality versus equity, um, and that's a big, big situation here. Maybe people don't understand the difference between the two, uh, and because I feel like a lot of times people say, well, you know, to use a very simple, you know, uh, example, well, you know, if black people have the same amount of opportunities as a white person does. They have ed- access to education. They can vote. They can do everything that we can do. Why can't they just get to where we are? Which is a complete oversimplification, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of. But sure. can you explain that debate and how it's not that simple and the difference between equality and equity and, and why that is the situation it is? Yeah, we often, those of us who, who are involved in this work, often use a, a, simple, um, um, a simple illustration to um, highlight the difference between equity and equality. And if you think about a group of kids trying to see over a fence, and you know, equality is giving all of the kids the same box, um, yet we know that all of those kids are not the same size. Um, equity is giving each child a box that they need, a tall enough box to see over that fence. And so, um, again, it, for for individuals who approach um, you know, who, who approach these very complicated matters from perspectives that well, everyone has the same opportunity. Um, America is the land of opportunity, but we do know. I mean, research has borne out, my own research has borne out that opportunity structures for, for um, white folks is different than for minorities. Um, if we think about the educational system and how education in the United States is funded, that's funded through tax dollars. Right, and so those those property tax dollars um, uh, look different in lower income communities than they do in middle income communities, and they do in then upper income communities. And so schools in wealthier neighborhoods have more property tax money to funnel into their local schools and can spend more money per child. And again, this too is an oversimplification of things, but that but this is an important issue. Um, so we can talk about. Um, fair and equitable distribution of of resources um, across um, you know across schools you know but that that's simply one piece of it um, as we think particularly now about the pandemic there there are very clear lines um, between folks who can stay at home and work um, like myself and and folks who have to go into work and so. Um, what happens to to those kids um, whose parents then um, are service workers or or other essential workers who are on the front lines who simply um, who simply can't stay at home and and educate their child in this home environment like we see so many um, school age children today. So again, you know. The, these these lines of distinction, these lines of, of oppression, these lines of, of, of opportunity are very are, are drawn very clear in a number of different ways. Again, um, we think about access to health care. We think about um, uh, folks who who may have contract work or who may be service workers or um, otherwise who might have have limited access to to good and quality health care, whose health insurance um, may not be the best or who simply can't afford the $400 out-of-pocket 
um, expense that um, you have to, you know, your deductible. And so, I mean, again, you know, all of these lines really do, um, you know, come, all these issues come together and, and create very different sets of opportunities. Well, with Kirk, when we look, when we look at all that, how do we, how do we move forward? How do we help address those situations? You know, you, me, people that can actually make differences, everyone at, the, at their own indiv individual level. Is it just, uh, you know, recognizing them, having those conversations and understanding where people are coming from and trying to work to improve those situations or what, what can be done, you know, at a legislative level, at a local level? Certainly, um, we, do need, we do need to have more critical conversation. Um, we need to understand as individuals our own, our own biases, um, our own um, implicit biases, you know, there, um, and there are ways to do that. Um, but I think certainly the time for, for talking has passed and the time for action is upon us. And so we need to sit down with, um, we need to sit down with a, a broad, diverse group of folks um, to better understand what the specific needs are, what the barriers are. And we have to sit down with our elected officials and, and talk and think critically about how do we create a legislative and regulatory environment that actually promotes access to healthcare, that actually um, promotes access to quality education, that um, provides jobs that pay. You know, and so, um, again, you know, this is complicated. If you or I could solve this dilemma today in this conversation, we would both win the Nobel Prize, and, and maybe that would be great for us. Um, but it, it, it starts... It starts with folks, um, again, who look like me, who um, are willing to have these conversations, who are willing to think critically, who are willing to engage um, our elected officials to, to push folks into thinking um, in radical ways. You know, how do we support rather than rather than punish? And you know, there are lots of, of safety net programs that we could have. We can to um, you know to our friends in Western Europe who have robust safety net programs and you know and we can do a much better job gotcha well Kirk Foster we're going to, have to leave it there I appreciate your insight and Kirk you are the associate dean of diversity equity and inclusion at the University of South Carolina thanks for joining us thank you Gavin I appreciate it Join me now is Mark Claxton. He's a former NYPD detective and director of public affairs for the Black Law Enforcement Alliance Mark thanks for being here my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And Mark, before we get into a host of issues, I want to ask you just for, to briefly give us an overview of your organization, the Black Law Enforcement Alliance. Uh, the Black Law Enforcement Alliance, uh, we call ourselves the activist think tank, and we are made up of uh, law enforcement professionals from various uh, agencies and states and organizations. And we come together really to facilitate conversations uh, with the community to educate people on the realities of law enforcement and uh, to, to force the conversation about the relevance of, of, of race as it relates to law enforcement. And Mark, you're based here in South Carolina. Uh, you obviously have worked in New York. You've been across the country. Tell me a little bit about what you think when we look at the social justice landscape of South Carolina and America right now. How do you see it? Uh, how are things going, in your opinion? I think everything is in flux. I mean, this is really is uh, this 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 year has really shown us uh, that uh, revolution is possible, if, you know, to say that, uh, and that is because of a series of events related to race, criminal justice, law enforcement. It's kind of forced some movement, some conversation, some acknowledgement, uh, and some better understanding about some of the challenges we face as a nation. And I don't think South Carolina is exempt from that. I think we're right in the middle and in the heart of, you know, I have relationships with people throughout the country, all over the place. And what we find is that oftentimes these issues pop up in our jurisdictions uh, because of uh, issues that we haven't dealt with historically. And I think it's an important time to do that. And perhaps we're, we're at that point in our history. Do you feel like things are moving forward in a good way, or at least these hard conversations that we keep talking about having are maybe actually starting to happen and, you know, maybe things are or at least being discussed, maybe improving? I tend to be an optimist, so I think uh, the movement for the most part is, is positive. Even the most difficult and challenging conversations that people have, I think, you know, we're try really trying to work out the issues to identify what the problems are, to come up with solutions that are palatable to all people. 
and most importantly, to ensure that justice is applied evenly and fairly, you know, across the board. Those are difficult discussions to have, especially when you have to have historical lessons in education. Those are painful realizations that people have to face, but it's necessary for us to move forward. So I think that's positive. And to be quite honest with you, I'm not sure how far we're going to go uh, in as far as making progress to defeat those things that keep us from being a unified nation. Mm -hmm. uh, when I we have multiple issues to talk about, but I heard from Washington, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser the other day. Uh, she. I didn't hear from her directly, but she said publicly that she fears the U.S. is descending into a race war with everything going on with the violence across the country as it continues and, and some of the harsh rhetoric we hear spouted around. We see shootings. Uh, do you fear that this is happening or do you feel like we are maybe uh, still there's the ability to have a conversation and to not descend into just, you know, back and forth based on race? I, I, I think we're having more uh, skirmishes more than anything else. I don't think we're at the point now where there will be quote unquote race wars necessarily. And I'm careful about using that type of uh, terminology because it sometimes sounds or comes across more insightful and provocative uh, than it needs to be. I think what is occurring uh, is that you have oftentimes extreme uh, positions, extreme beliefs on either side, and those two far ends of the spectrum have the most issue and the most problem. What we don't want to do is to introduce into it any kind of physicality. I think responsible minds, individuals who have a history and a legacy of providing direction, sound direction, will all say that the best uh, uh, strategy in times like this is protest, is demonstration, is increased voicing of opposition, uh, but you really have to minimize or eliminate uh, any, any form of violence uh, during the course of these discussions. Mm -hmm. And Mark, sometimes it is a one-sided discussion. People seem to be yelling one way or the other, not hearing each other. Do you ever feel like you're caught in the middle there too when you look at your, your police background and then also being a black man? Is it difficult to discuss these issues? Do you feel like sometimes people are what cast judgment upon you for your background and for, for your race as well? I'm sorry, you froze up just for a second, or maybe I froze up. Could you just <laughs> Just, <laughs> Mark, asking you about, about your background as a police officer, and obviously you are a black man as well. It seems like a tough spot to be in. Uh, how have you dealt with that? I mean, have people caused, you know, judged you or, or vice versa, just regardless of which side of the uh, political spectrum they're on? How, you, how do you walk this? How do you navigate this? Obviously, you can be both. Sure, absolutely, and I think that people do... I think the mistake that people make is to identify or attempt to place on an individual their identity based on their occupation. You know, I'm very proud of the work that I did as a police officer in, in New York. I mean, I had really some, you know, uh, uh, some challenging positions, et cetera, but it's an honorable profession. And part of what my organization does is to insist that we maintain that high level of professionalism. However, let's be clear about something. I was born a black man, and I'm a die black man. So there are certain realities and experiences that I had that my, my white counterparts in the police department never had, never had to experience, never had to be concerned about. And in addition to that, my family is, 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 is largely a black family. So we have challenges that perhaps they don't have. Now, that's, oftentimes that could be just a matter of a sharing experiences so we have a fuller, a better understanding. But sometimes people assume that the life that they're living and the experiences that they have apply to you, and that's a mistake. So do I have problems on occasion? Or have I have problems with people understanding, you know, this police officer, especially when it's vocal as I am, you know, against the negative aspects of policing? Yes, I do have issues and problems with that, but I stand convicted that I am a black man first, and I assume that position very proudly, and I'm determined to, to educate, inform, uh, uh, protect, and provide security and safety for my community. Yeah, because I think a lot of times people do see, oh, all police are bad, all protesters are bad, there's no in-between here. Uh, and obviously we know that's not the case, there is substantial room there to discuss, but unfortunately we get siloed it seems like. And I know this might be an oversimplification, but what do you maybe see people doing wrong, you know, if, if, whether it be protesters or people in general, and maybe what you see uh, cops doing wrong as well, and then what are they doing right in your opinion when we look at this overall 
discussion, you know, with the right versus wrong with police and protesters at this situation? I think what people, I'll start with the people, what people are doing uh, uh, wrong, especially as, as it relates to demonstrations and protests, is not calling out those individuals in the midst of their protests and demonstrations who are behaving or conducting themselves contrary to the goals and objectives of your individual protest movement. Listen, you can, it, it is wise, it is honorable to demonstrate in the protest, be, ver, be vocal uh, about the, your objections, etc. But if the person next to you has another objective, you ought to call that out and you ought to point that person out and you ought to disassociate yourselves from that person. What I think the, what I think the people are doing perfectly right is protesting, is demonstrating, is being as loud as possible is being disruptive. That's the nature of protest. That's how you get things to change. And that's honorable and, and decent and the right thing people are doing. What I think the police are doing wrong well is relying too heavily on the military, military type equipment, tactics, and style. I think it's a mistake for governments to call, just a knee-jerk reaction, to call in uh, the National Guard or outside resources, federal assistance, whenever there are disruptions uh, within their jurisdictions. Um, I think what the police are doing right is, be, well, they're being forced to, to listen, to hear, and to face and confront some of the demands of the citizens. Mm -hmm. And I was going to kind of say, you know, we, we recently saw an incident here in Columbia where a police officer uh, used racial slur, used the N-word against a man who he said used it at him first. Uh, he repeated it several times, didn't seem to de-escalate the situation, was then fired for those reasons. Um, you know, when we look at that, what are, proactive step, what are proactive steps that departments can take to address these situations, you know, and show that they are listening to a concerned public and actually making a difference? Because it seems like, yes, I'm sure there are a lot of positive things happening that we obviously don't hear about, but then unfortunately the, the situations that are the worst are the ones we do hear about. It doesn't seem like things are changing. Well, I can tell you something in regards to the incident that you mentioned. Um, that was swift action. That was decisive, swift action. And that people pay attention to that. That, that is to be commended. You know, and that should be replicated in agencies across the, the state and the nation. Sometimes I think uh, police agencies tend to rely on the old, we're conducting an investigation as a stall tactic, not realizing that the longer it takes to resolve these issues, the less confidence that people have in you. They handled it the right way. They are to be commended. And really, the manner in which and the speed in which they took it, uh, handled that case should be replic replicated throughout the, the nation. That's the way you do it. It will restore confidence. Uh, it'll restore the confidence of people in policing, and it, it, that 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 really establishes your professional standing. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it's, you know that that swift action doesn't really give time for people to to react to it. They see it, they know the facts, they make a decision on it. That's what people respect, is what you're saying. Okay. Along those lines, and we have about two minutes left, Mark. Uh, we did see some charges dropped against protesters down in Charleston from the Charleston Police Department after the Mar after the May 31st uh, protests. There were obviously riots a little bit later that evening, but we're talking about the protesters who were charged on failing to disperse or on curfew violations. Uh, you know, some of these call some people call these these charges as you know questionable. You know, I was all not walking on the sidewalk. You get arrested, things like that. There's a lot of uh, you know variety there and discretion that officers can use. Uh, so, what amount of discretion should officers be using in these protest situations, in your opinion? You know, when does it border into you know them you know infringing on someone's First Amendment rights versus the, the just letting a protest take place? I think it's I think it's important for those people acting on behalf of the government to understand the history of the nation. And uh, much of the movement, the positive movement in this nation, was built on protest, was built on demonstration. And not all activities within a protest or a demonstration should be treated as criminal events. You should be mindful, and you got to be situationally aware. I think when it crosses over into physical assault, uh, extensive property damage, those type of things should really be enforced. But uh, uh, blocking pedestrian traffic, if you will, you know, disrupting the, the flow of vehicular traffic, you know, noise ordinances, those type of things within the, the, uh, the course of a protest should be handled in the way in which they decided to handle those cases 
and largely dismiss them. Mm -hmm. You want to move those people along if you have to summons them, summons them. But ultimately, don't tie up the system with people uh, uh, or do patriotic duty. Mm -hmm. And Mark, with 30 seconds left, can you just give me maybe your your words on how you feel going forward, what you're looking forward to in, in, in the future? I'm looking forward to uh, additional legislation that could provide some relief and really some direction moving forward. But I think it's important for people to understand that legislation alone won't fix what ails us, that we have the responsibility to continue these discussions in hopes of coming to some agreement or at least some peace and some reckoning about the role of race plays uh, in general in the history of this nation, uh, but more specifically the role that race plays in law enforcement. To keep you updated on the latest news in South Carolina, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast that we drop multiple times a week that you can find on any podcast app or on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. You all, South Carolina.